Well, hello and welcome back to another episode of Quantitative Bytes. It's great to see you all. I hope you're doing well. So today we're continuing with the series of videos on building a linear algebra library in C++. And this video specifically is part two of my mini series within that looking at implementing a class to handle vectors. So if you remember in the previous episode, we looked at the code required to implement a class to, well, to handle vectors in terms of basic vector arithmetic and managing uh, the vector data and so on. And as I promised then, this video, in this video, what we're going to do is look at extending that a little bit further to just add a little bit more functionality. And I thought putting all of this together into one video last week would have simply made that video too long. So I've created another video uh, this week, um, as I say, where we simply extend things, go that a little bit further. Um, so hopefully that will be of interest. Now, of course, as I say, always say, if you like this video, please do remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so that you don't have to miss any future videos. I do try to make a video roughly once a week, so if you subscribe, you don't need to worry about missing anything. Okay, so without much further ado, let's have a look at how we can extend the QB vector class that we were talking about in the previous video. Okay, so what I wanted to do was to build on the work that we did last week with the QB vector class, really just to add some a new functionality and some, some new specific uh, uh, operators uh, for vectors. So the first of those really is I want to be able to calculate the norm of a vector or the magnitude of a vector, the mathematical notation for which is like so. And I then also want to be have a function that will return a normalized copy of the vector. We'll talk about what it means to normalize a vector in a moment. And then I also want to be able to normalize the vector in place. So I have two options for vector normalization. One is a function that leaves the vector as it is, but returns a normalized copy. And the other is a function that will normalize the vector in place. So it doesn't return anything. It will simply normalize the vector and we lose the original. And I also wanted to add support for multiplying an instance of the QB matrix two class by an instance of the QB vector class, which is something that's really useful. So that requires going into the QB matrix two code that we looked at in the um, previous videos, looking at handling matrices and making some changes there. So we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so the vector norm, if we have a vector A, uh, defined as elements A1 through to AN, as we've seen before, then very simply the norm of A denoted this, or the magnitude of A. Now you will sometimes see the norm um, denoted with double bars. I'm only using single vertical bars here because we are specifically talking about the Cartesian coordinate space, and I do believe that in that specific instance this is um, acceptable notation. The more general notation is to have double vertical bars either side. I think, as I say, um, to the best of my knowledge, this notation is um, correct when you are specifically referring to the Cartesian coordinate system, which I am. Okay, and the norm of the vector is very simply given by the square root of the sum of the squares of all of the elements. That's it. And that gives a single scalar quantity that represents the magnitude, or if you like, the length of that specific vector. Okay. The other thing that I want to implement is functions to normalize the vector. Now, the equation for a normalized version of A, so the normalized version of the vector A is the vector A divided by the norm of vector A. It does get a little bit confusing. So if we call this the magnitude of vector A, I think it makes more sense. So the vector A divided by the magnitude of vector A, which is, of course, essentially um, one over the magnitude multiplied by vector A, because this depth division is, doesn't necessarily make sense. So if we define it this way as a scalar quantity here, multiplied by the vector, we saw in the previous video how we can do uh, implement that. And then, of course, with the elements of the normalized version, simply each element is then just divided by the magnitude number. So the magnitude of A, so we have A1 divided by the magnitude of A, A2 divided by the magnitude of A, and so on. And what the normalized version of the vector is, is it means a vector that has a length of one. So whatever our original vector was, whatever direction it's pointing in, after normalization, it will still point in that direction, but it will now have a magnitude of exactly one or a length of one, but it points in the same direction. Okay. And the last thing that I want to do is to add the functionality to multiply a matrix by a vector. Now, for fairly obvious reasons, it doesn't make any sense to do this the other way around. We can't do a vector times a matrix. And you can see why here. So we're only going to consider the three by three uh, case here for this example. So we have vector A multiplied, no, sorry, <clears throat> we have our matrix A multiplied by a vector B, which is going to give us a vector C. And our vector uh, 
matrix A with the elements A11 through to A33. This is a square matrix, a 3 by 3 square matrix, multiplied by B with elements B1, B2, and B3. And that's going to return a vector with elements C1, C2, and C3. And, of course, as we've seen before for matrix multiplication, the result we get is simply going to be this. So we have um, A11 times B1 plus A12 times B2 plus A13 times B3, and that gives us C1. And then we have A21 times B1 plus A22 times B2 plus A23 times B3, and that gives us the value for C2. And then we have A31 times B1 plus A32 times B2 plus A33 times B3, and that's going to give us the value for C3. And that's actually it. That is basically all of the functionality that I want to uh, add in this particular episode. So it's, it's not really very much, but I think it really is worth uh, just talking about it. Okay, so if we look at the qbvector.h code that we talked about in the previous video, I've gone ahead and added some various functions and made some minor changes. So one minor change that I've made is that I've put the const keyword after um, all of the functions that are definitely not going to make any changes. So things like get num dims to return the number of dims, that can be a const because it's definitely not going to make any changes to the object, um, the data within the instance of the class. So we should declare that as const. Likewise, get element, um, obviously not set element because that's clearly going to make changes. So that actually is a new function since last time. Set element allows us to specify uh, an index and a value and it will modify the element at that index to that that value. I've then added functions to perform the computations on the vector, so the function to return the length of the vector, which I've simply called norm, it returns the value of type t. Uh, we want to return, be able to return a normalized copy of the vector, so this obviously returns a QB vector instance of type t, and the function is called normalized. And then also I want a function, as I said before, to be able to normalize the vector in place. So this doesn't return anything, so its return type is void, and this function is called normalize important to note the distinction between those two. That's actually everything that I've added in the class definition. So let's have a look at the, the new code specifically. So the I've added the set element um, function here for setting an element that very simply just does m underscore vector data of index equals value. Of course we really should put some code in there to check that index is valid before we do that. Um, yes, I, I haven't done that. We should do it. I will probably do it at some point in the future. And then we have our code now to calculate the, the norm. So we talked about how the norm is calculated just now. So we have our uh, function here. We're going to define a variable cumulative sum of type t, uh, originally um, set to 0, which we static cast to type t. And then we're simply going to loop over every element of our vector. And we do cumulative sum as plus equal to m underscore vector data at i multiplied by m underscore vector data at i. Okay, so that is simply going to take the square of each element. So we're simply going to add a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared and so on, which is exactly um, as we saw in the slides just now. And then we simply return the square root of that value. And that's how we calculate the norm. Very simple. And we then have our function that will return a normalized copy of the vector. So this has a return type here, a QB vector of type T, uh, called normalized, right? And the first thing we do is we compute the vector norm. So that's a scalar quantity of type T vec norm equals this um, dot norm. So we calculate the norm using the function we've just talked about. And then to compute the normalized version of the vector, all we have to do is we create a new instance of QB vector called result initialized with m underscore vector data, which we're then going to modify. Um, and then we simply return result multiplied by um, 1 divided by the vector norm. Okay, so very simple. And that's everything that we need to calculate the normalized vector. Because we've already overloaded the multiply operation, this is essentially a vector multiplied by a scalar, and we've already written the code to do that, which we talked about in the previous video. Okay, so, and then we come to the function that will normalize the vector in place. This has a return type of void, because it doesn't return anything. It's called normalize. And it's essentially the same operation, but it's arranged a little bit differently. We don't rely on the multiplication operator that we've already implemented here. What we're going to do instead is to loop over every element and modify it as we go. So, so we loop over all of the elements in the vector, 
we define a variable called temp of type t, which we set equal to m underscore vector data at i, multiplied by 1 over the vector norm. And then we modify the m vector data at i uh, to be equal to temp. And that's it. We simply loop over all of that, and that will go through, and it will replace the vector that we have with the normalized version of that vector. OK? OK, so that is actually everything for the QB vector class. Now, I mentioned the other condition that we wanted to be able to do is to be able to do matrix multiplied by a vector. So that requires making modifications to the QB matrix class that we've been talking about in the previous videos. So if we have a look at QB matrix dot H, um, the one change that I have made here right at the top is, of course, we have to include QB vector dot H that we've just been talking about. So this is just my path to QB vector dot H. Um, if you're implementing this code yourself, it's quite likely that you'll have something different. In fact, what would make a lot more sense would be to put QB vector and QB matrix together into one directory, or one folder. I haven't done that at the moment because of the way I divide things up for making these videos, but Ultimately, when I come to start putting these together into a linear algebra library, then they will exist in the same directory, and so, you know, everything will be uh, simpler. But for now, I've simply defined the um, exact path to that, like so. The only change that we've made, really, in the class definition of QB matrix 2 is to add the definition of a new overload of the multiplication operator um, here. So we have, this is a friend. Uh, function, so it's a friend of the class, so we have to use template class u, a QB vector of u operator multiply, so we're overloading the multiply operator, and as before, we accept as input the left hand side is an instance of QB matrix 2, the right hand side now, however, notice is an instance of the QB vector class that we've just been talking about. So this will be for the specific condition where we have an instance of QB matrix 2 multiplied by an instance of the QB vector class. So let's have a look at the code to actually implement that. And it would be down in overloaded operators uh, minus multiply. Here we go. So this is the code for matrix times vector. OK, so we have our obviously function declaration, as we've just talked about. The first thing we need to do is verify the dimensions of the input. So we need to make sure that the matrix, the left hand side matrix, which we can access the private member here because we're in a friend. So this function is a friend. Notice, of course, it's not actually a member of the class. It's only a friend of the class, OK? So if the number of columns in our matrix is not equal to the number of dimensions in the vector, then performing the multiplication isn't going to make any sense. So we throw an error, OK? As I said before in the previous video, at the moment I'm just using std invalid argument. Um, ultimately, that should be replaced with something uh, perhaps more meaningful to this specific condition. But for now, that will do. Uh, we're then going to make a copy of the input vector. So we define a new uh, QB vector instance uh, called result, which is equal to RHS. We're then going to loop over the rows and columns and perform the multiplication operation element by element. So we loop over the rows and columns of our matrix and perform the operations as we go. So let's have a look how that works. We have our first outer loop over the rows and we have our inner loop here over the columns. In each time through our loop over the rows, we initialize our cumulative sum, uh, of course, of type T uh, to zero, our static cast to type T, OK, as we've seen before. And then in our inner loop uh, over all of the columns, we simply do cumulative sum plus equals um, LHS, let the matrix dot get element row column multiplied by right hand side, which of course the vector dot get element column. OK, so row, column for the matrix, and just column for the vector. And the effect of that will be to loop over the columns of the matrix and to loop down the rows of the vector as we go. And as we just saw in the slide we were looking at just now, that is how we would go about doing the multiplication between a matrix and a vector. OK, so we loop over all of those. So each time through um, the outer loop, we're going to set uh, the successive elements of a result as we go, equal to cumulative sum, and then we repeat that loop again, and then simply we return result, and that's it. That is actually all we need to do in the QB matrix uh, .h file there uh, to implement the condition of a matrix multiplied by a scalar. OK, so looking at tesco.cpp, this is the uh, tesco.cpp in the uh, for the vector class that we were talking about in the previous video. I've added just at the top here um, the hash include to bring in qbmatrix.h, which at the moment is coming from the specific path, as I said before. And ultimately, we put them in the same path, so that might be different in the end. But for now, that's what we do that works. And then the I've added code to test the new thing. So to test the 
computational functions. I've added code to test computing the length of the vector using the norm function that we implemented. And we do that on test vector 1, 2, and 5. And then to test that we can compute the normalized versions of those. So first using the normalized function that returns a copy of the vector that has been normalized or returns a copy of the vector after normalization, probably sounds better. Uh, so we do that with test vector 1, test vector 2, and test vector 5. And then we test normalization in place uh, on test vector 1. We do test vector 1.normalize, which doesn't return anything, but simply replaces test vector 1 with a normalized version. And then we print that out to see that that works. And then finally, we do we test the condition of test matrix multiplied by vector. So we define uh, a test matrix um, using uh, the test matrix data here. So we're using uh, an instance of the vector class from the standard library of type double to store test matrix data, which contains the nine elements there for a three by three identity matrix. And we set that up into an instance of the QB matrix two class called test matrix, uh, three by three and test matrix data. And we display that and then we test that we can do test matrix multiplied by test vector one. And of course, because this is the identity matrix, the resulting vector should be identical to the original. Um, and there we go. Okay, so if we save that, I don't think I made any changes, but it's good practice. Let's compile that to test code, test code.cpp minus standard equals C17. Okay, and if we run our code, like so, now let's have a look. I won't go over the things that we looked at before um, because we talked about those previously. So we test the computational functions with the length of test vector one, which is 3.742, the length of test vector two, which is 7.485, which is exactly double um, test vector one, which makes sense. And we have the length of test vector five, 6.020. Now, I, again, I tested those in other software. Those are the right results. And we then retest that we can return normalized copies of those vectors. So the normalized copy of test vector one gives that. The normalized copy of test vector two gives that notably exactly the same. So test vector one and test vector two, when we normalize them, the results are the same because, of course, they're exactly parallel. OK, so we normalize them to a unit vector. That unit vector is obviously going to be the same. And then we normalize test vector 5, which gives us a different result. Again, I've checked those in other software. That is correct. We then test normalization in place with test vector 1. And of course, it gives the same result that we saw there, exactly what we'd expect. And finally, we test the condition of, of matrix multiplied by vector with our 3 by 3 identity matrix multiplied by test vector 1, which of course gives the same result that we had originally. OK, and I've tested all of the checked all of that with other software, and I do believe those to be the right answers. OK, so there we go. That's really everything I wanted to talk about today. We've seen now all of the code that we need to implement a reasonably functional class for handling vectors in C++ that will go on to make a very useful component of the linear algebra library that we're putting together. Anyway, I really do hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been a great deal of pleasure making it. Um, if you have liked this video, please do remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so that you don't have to miss any future videos. OK, well, I really hope you've enjoyed the video. It's been a great deal of pleasure making it, and I really look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.